It is a beautiful summer evening in New Haven, Connecticut, close to Yale University, in an auditorium just like this. And it's packed with about 350 people. And it is a magical evening because it is a celebration of a program of, that we were all part of. We were graduating and we could bring our family and friends and it was a very exciting evening. So in this magical evening, I decided to bring the woman that I loved, the woman that I had graduated with, gone to graduate school, and I had known her for a few years. So I bring her to this event, and everybody's sharing about themselves and introducing themselves. And this magical evening, I decided that the moment was right. And something that I had been preparing for, and I thought she was ready for, so I asked for the microphone, and yes, I go down on my knees, and I pop the question, will you marry me? Silence. <laughs> I thought she didn't hear it. So I go again, will you marry me? Silence for what seemed like an eternity. And then after a long pause, she goes, I'm not sure. What would you do? I felt like shrinking and disappearing in the crowd. I didn't know how to react. What would you do? How would you react in these type of situations? As you think about this, the key question is, how do we create a space, a sacred space in our lives when something happens to us? And then how do we respond to it? Because as Viktor Frankl said, this is a very sacred space. In how we respond to things that happen in our life, in our choice we make, lies our future growth and possibility. Now, how do you do this, right? It's easier said than done. We are always reminded, you know, you can't control the things that happen in your life, but you can control your actions. But it is easier said than done. How do we do it? Life can be a struggle. You know, it's not, you may not have these type of situations when somebody rejects you in front of 350 people often, but often on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, something happens and we get upset and we want to react. You know, or your plans don't go the way like you plan and it upsets you and you react. Right? In these type of situations, how do we make better choices? What do we do? Right? So before I tell you what happened that evening, I want to introduce you to two of my best friends. And I promise you, once you meet them, they will become your best friends too. That's what this talk is about. So my two best friends are Ben and Bob. Now, we all have an inner voice right? We all have an inner voice that talks to us all the time. And now there is research based on ACT or acceptance and commitment theory and CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, that if you take this voice and give it a name, it creates a space, it creates a distance. Then it's not you, it's not me. And then I don't have to agree with everything that she's telling me, right? So, so what does this mean? Let's take a look at a few examples, right? So you have cookies in front of you. And of course, you are tempted and you're craving. You want to eat those delicious chocolate. You know, you want that. You want that, right? So you, uh, the Ben is telling you, come on, take two. Nobody's looking, right? And Bob is telling you that, hey, uh, later on, you may not feel that good. 
and in the long term, it may have you know, health impact and you may gain weight, right? So uh, you get an email, right? And you want to respond to it very quickly uh, and in an angry way because you didn't like what he was saying. So you want to text, you want to tweet, but Bob is telling you what's going to be the consequence of your reaction. You want a Gucci bag. Bob is telling you, do you really need it? You are looking at how many followers I have, how many likes do I have, how many profit we have made in this quarter, and Bob is telling you, what's the real connection? Is there any value? Is there any impact? You see, Bob knows that everything has a benefit because, you know, uh, there is a benefit in front of everything we do. But oftentimes, this is a fake benefit or a false price. So how do these imaginary friends help me every day? They help me create a space or a distance. You see, we all live in a bubble, and as humans, we forget that we live in a bubble. So Ben wants me to stay in my bubble. Bob wants me to pull out of that bubble. Ben wants me to reinforce my biases. Bob wants me to take me out of the biases. Whenever I get in a tough situation, I always ask, what would Ben do and what would Bob do? So here's the thing. I know as you're listening to this, you're thinking, oh, I get this. What he's talking about is like, oh, the two angels on each shoulder, the devil and the you know, angel, right? Or, but no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's easier, the good and evil. But here what we are talking about is big and bigger, or good and better. So sleeping in the morning in your blanket is good. It makes you feel good. But getting up, right, and working out is better, right? Texting to somebody and responding very quickly is good, makes you feel good. You get it off of your chest. But holding off is better. Not speaking up when you see something is not right is good because you will keep your job. But speaking up is bigger, right? Cleaning up trash is good, but taking that trash and making art of that is bigger. Starting a business is good, but starting a business with a cause is bigger. You see, everything in life has this, uh, we can use Ben and Bob in all of our aspects of life. So how many of you have arguments with your wives and husbands or your spouses? How many of you have arg arguments? Right? So today, you know, if you meet Ben and Bob, it will change. Because, ben, you know, in any argument, you have a choice. You want to be right or you want to be happy. Ben wants to be right. Bob wants to be. So how did I discover Ben and Bob? My day job is strategy execution. I work with organizations and companies around the world. And what I see is that there is a big disconnect between strategy and execution, between outputs and outcomes. Everybody is busy doing busy work, but they don't challenge themselves to how does this connect with the big picture of the organization. So we measure things like what are my likes, uh, uh, how much uh, you know, profit am I gonna make in this quarter? But the Bob aspect is how, what are the outcomes? What are the outcomes? That's the benefit of the benefit. Now, organizations that can connect the strategy and execution, because strategy is all about making choices, making tough choices that achieve bigger and better results, right? So how do, we, how do we do that? That's very rare, by the way, where organizations can link strategy and execution and link performance with purpose. But when that happens, it is magical. So let me share one uh, organization that we are all familiar with. And I heard this story first when I was working with teams at NASA. So this is a rare period in the 1960s in, during the Apollo program at NASA. So the story goes something like this. There is a bathroom, and there is a janitor who cleans the bathroom. So he's cleaning the bathroom, and in walks somebody. And they notice that today, 
the bathroom is looking extra clean. So they say, you know, hey, uh, thank you. Thank you for cleaning the bathroom. It's looking beautiful. The guy looks up and he says, sir, I'm not cleaning the bathroom. He says, really? He's puzzled. So he asks, what are you doing then? He says, sir, I'm not cleaning the bathroom. I'm putting help a man on the moon. Right. So you see, in our organizations, most of the time what we are doing is cleaning the bathroom. We measure and reward people for cleaning the bathroom. You know, we, we look at how many things we can check off, how many things we have produced, uh, uh, how, much, how many followers, how many likes we have. But Bob is asking, what is the outcome? What is the benefit of the benefit? Now, you can really push the Bob and look for the Bob of the Bob, which goes beyond outputs and outcomes, because that is more you're thinking about long-term reputation, sustenance, uh, your impact and legacy. That's why companies like Google do not uh, care much about their quarterly results, because they are more focused on what is the impact we are going to leave 100 or 200 years from now. So as you're listening, you, you might be thinking, I'm suggesting that Ben is good and Bob is better, right? Not really. Because you see, Ben has benefit, right? And you can't have Bob without Ben, right? So how do we resolve this paradox, right, between Ben and Bob? They are not good and bad. They are good and better, big and bigger. So there should be a healthy choice, conflict and balance between the two. You see, Ben has his feet on the ground. Bob has his head on the clouds. Ben is focused. Bob is diffused. Uh, ben is looking for quick solutions. Bob is making sure I'm asking the right questions. Ben is saying, how can I quickly become successful? Bob is saying, how can I serve? How can I be more useful? So I know you're thinking, how do I practice this? Have you seen birds? You know how they eat? They, they're focused on the food that's in front of them, right? So they peck and then they pause and see, scan the horizon to see who, what are the predators. So they peck and they pause, they peck and they pause. It's almost like they are alternating between Ben and Bob, Ben and Bob. So how do we combine the best of these two, Ben and Bob, right? Now there's research uh, of successful leaders from around the world in multiple industries. And one of the things they found in the research is that people who are very successful, they can take two opposing ideas and bring them together and combine them and integrate them and create something that's even better. It's like Roger Martin said, it's not like you're doing one at the expense of other, but you're combining the two to produce something that's better. So, let's go back to that evening. If you're wondering what happened that evening, right? And I got rejected in front of 350 people. What did I do? Did I hide? Did I disappear? There were women coming up to me and saying, Jack, get rid of her, I'm available. <laughs> but you know what? At that point, I didn't have my Ben and Bob that developed, but there was a little bit of Bob in me, so I persisted. And you know what? It took a while, but she listened to her Bob, and finally she said yes. Now, now, that's fine, but I want to show you the outcome and impact of that. The picture I want to show you was with my daughter and my daughter, Nina, at her graduation. And that would not have happened if I had listened to my Ben that day. So sometime back, my mother-in-law said, you have one good quality. I said, one? She's never said anything nice to me. 
So she said, I have one good quality. So I said, what, what, please tell me, what is it? She said, you forget things easily. And I didn't know how to tell her that. I didn't know how to tell her that. That's the reason I married your daughter. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed meeting my best friends, Ben and Bob. I hope they become your best friends because they will help you in any tough situation to ask the right questions, to get you outside your bubble, and to make tough choices. I believe in today's world more than ever that more people need to understand this distinction between Ben and Bob, especially if you are a leader, a politician, or a CEO, especially if you're struggling with inside, inward versus outward, long-term versus short-term, mindless reaction versus thoughtful possibility, good versus better, big versus bigger. I believe that if more people discover their Ben and Bob, we will create a better space and we will make this world a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.